The legacy of Antonio Gramsci, the revolutionary co-founder of the Italian Communist Party who remained active up to the Third International of 1926, dramatizes the historical political process of ideological repurposing enabled by a special category of sign we might call the floating signifier. After Claude Levi-Strauss's structuralist gloss on Marcel Mauss's anthropological investigation of circuits of material and linguistic exchange that bind, unbind, and rebind social relations contingent on historical circumstance. Recent scholarship, notably Emanuele Saccarelli's book entitled Gramsci and Trotsky in the Shadow of Stalinism, has thoroughly accounted the Italian Communist Party's successive reinventions of Gramsci's voice, which had been forged in his dynamic and historically contingent battle for position in the service of its, the party's, official record. Saccarelli traces between the lines of the PCI's philological stewardship of Gramsci's corpus, finding ample evidence of the extent to which its reliance on nationalism during the Cold War effectively neutralized and reframed Gramsci's commitment to class struggle. And here is Saccarelli, quote, the immediate post-war, the immediate post-World War II period provided the party with an opportunity to stake its claim as the main torchbearer of a national and democratic party that was being threatened by the revival of clerical obscurantism, American interference, and so on. In this context, making Gramsci available for public consumption was a way for the PCI to broaden its appeal as a national before it was partisan and cultural before it was political force." End quote. This Gramsci was disarticulated from his passionate insurrectionary voice, first in 1928, the infamous year of drift, as it's called, or the moment of Stalinist consolidation within the Communist Party in Moscow, and now again a second time in Cold War Italian reception. I have argued elsewhere, as an art historian rather than a historian, that this post-war manufacture of an intellectual rather than a revolutionary Gramsci operates in inverse of the way Italian artists were self-consciously extricating themselves from the nationalist heritage of Italian futurism and programmatically embracing the international avant-garde by taking up its primary paradigms, such as the monochrome and the ready-made, to generate an at once autochthonous and internationalist idiom against American cultural imperialism. I noted not only the immediate post-war generation of painters' distaste for Italian modernism and futurism, which smacked of fascist regression and passeist nationalism, but a concomitant tactical embrace of otherwise contradictory modernist and avant-gardist practices, most of which explicitly index the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the monochrome. My analysis of this difficult recovery of an avant-garde aesthetic trope thus explored Gramsci's burdened inheritance as a lens by which to frame the politically fraught return of cultural signifiers in the battleground for political meaning during a Cold War fought on Italian soil by economic, if not military, means. I argued that the monochrome acts as a floating signifier negotiating delicate political vectors in moments of seismic historical transition. But I noted also the deafening silence on the part of self-identified communist artists such as Piero Manzoni on the topic of Gramsci, despite the common currency of origins located to 1917, be it in the dream of communism or the art forms associated with it. It doesn't seem to have been in the interest of an artist previously associated with fascism and nationalism, such as Lucio Fontana, to have cited Gramsci either. This struck me as curious. 
How might a historical figure be tasked to perform a set of historicist operations analogous to that of a cultural trope? How is the nationalism espoused by the PCI, for which Gramsci came to serve as mascot, mobilized to launder its betrayal of class politics and conciliations to American economic interests in the context of the Marshall Plan, in which American fixed capital fueled the miracolo italiano, driving a belated economic modernity voracious for labor power drawn from the rural south? How does its espousal of Italian culture and here I trace the way in which Gramsci came to be recuperated as a cultural treasure, again, rather than a political actor, ramify in and against a political horizon acquiescing to American financial colonization under the false sign of national reconstruction. That's the primary paradox. Today's presentation will isolate official culture's use of the signifier Gramsci in scare quotes is a vehicle of polite neutralization and assimilation of re revolutionary communist aspirations to parliamentary and party politics. So this next section is subtitled Defensive National Identity. From 1949 to 1969, a form of liberal national identity now differentiated from the recent fascist past suspended and deferred numerous contradictions Structuring Italy's recovery is it hung in the balance between American financial sponsorship and the shadow of imperial state communism or socialism in one country per Slo Stalin's slogan of 1924 to the East. The embrace of national culture in this context would seem to be as unlikely as its rejection among painters in their own battle for position. To delineate this knot of political cultural contradiction, some historical reconstruction will be necessary. The relationship between the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and the formation of the Italian Communist Party in 1921 is not an especially complicated one. It is, however, clouded by the distorted narratives that characterize the history of the state-sponsored Communist Party in the USSR after the aforementioned year of drift, after Stalin's 1927 centralization of power and maniacal emphasis on industrial growth at any cost. In this regard, the PCI closely resembles the history of the Communist Party in Moscow. This parallelism, moreover, indicates the proximity between Rome and Moscow during the years of the Comintern 1919 through 1943. Let us isolate the origins of the Italian chapter of communism to 1921. Antoni Antonio Gramsci and Amedio Bordega founded the Italian Communist Party in 1921, precipitating a split from the more popular socialist party, the PSI, a half century later, Rodolfo Morandi of the PSI considered the 1921 split between the socialists and the communists a fundamentally calamitous mistake as he attempted to return, attempted to return to and repair that moment of rupture by seeking a third path between Bolshevism and a model of social democracy reliant on the writing of Rosa Luxemburg. But in the end, Morandi's model of socialism resembled more closely a defanged Bolshevization in which Soviet-like clubs would ward off insurrectionary energies by mediating the most favorable terms by which the working class might be best absorbed by hegemonic <coughs> reconstruction. Morandi became the minister of industry in the second of de Gasperi's cabinets immediately after World War II. From 1921 through 1926, both Bordiga and Gramsci shared steerage of the party with a board of four others, including Palmiro Togliatti, who was by many accounts the most eager of the group to curry favor with Soviet leadership. His campaign to curry favor paid off after the war when Togliatti won leadership over the PCI. But in 1921, the party explicitly understood itself as part of an international organization, part of the common turn of the Third International. This arrangement lasted five years. 
1926 was a difficult year for the PCI, with factions already splitting across, splitting across the PCI in its ties to the common turn it understood itself to be part of. Gramsci won an international election against a far-left faction led by Bordiga just before Benito Mussolini and the fascists rose to power and imprisoned him. At this point, Bordiga became a matter of contention in relations between Rome and Moscow, a status followed right thereafter by Gramsci while interned. He became a matter of contention and rewriting while in prison. Among the three primary voices at the time, the ever curry favoring Palmiro Taliati maintained party stability by nurturing passable relations with Moscow. But were we to momentarily suspend deference to received signposts of political affiliation, such as right, left, and centrist, and examine the actual terms, the content of Gramsci and Bordiga's disagreement, we would notice Gramsci's persistent emphasis on the continuity of revolutionary direct action against Bordiga's position, paradoxically labeled left. In 1926, Gramsci tried to stage a coup against Bordiga, charging him with a form of passivity resulting from a discursively radical, if pragmatically impotent, reading of capital. In his essay, Maximalist, Maximalist and Maximalism and Extremism, excuse me, dating to 1925, Gramsci argued that Bordiga's blind faith in the late Marx and a misreading of capital that class struggle would automatically foment from conditions intrinsic to capitalist's automated destructive force. For Gramsci, in deference to Lenin, revolution would have to be driven by conscious will conscious intention. Here is once again, uh, or here is Gramsci from uh, Maximalism and Extremism. Quote, the Maximalist Bordiga is intransigent and not opportunist. He believes that it would be pointless to act and struggle day after day. He is only waiting for the great day. The masses, he says, cannot but come to us because the objective situation is driving them to the revolution. And so let's wait without all these stories about tactical maneuvers and like expedience. For us, this for us is maximalism, exactly like that of the maximalist party. The entire pre-revolutionary period presents itself as one of primarily tactical activity directed at acquiring new alliances for the proletariat breaking up the enemy's offensive and defensive organizational apparatus and detecting and exhausting his reserves. Not taking account of this, or only taking account of it theoretically without putting it in practice, without making it become daily activity, means being a maximalist, that is, speaking grand revolutionary words while being incapable of taking a step along the road of revolution, end quote. So it's, it's interesting uh, that Bordiga would be coded far left, um, given, given Gramsci's assessment. It becomes evident that Gramsci insists on revolutionary agency and will against the radical left's insistence that revolution would be historically contingent on given objective structural conditions inherent to capitalist development. Echoing his stance of 1917 in a text published in Avanti entitled The Revolution Against Capital, which had argued contra the Marxian-Leninist telos that uneven development would be an asset for the proletariat and, and peasantry, the proletariat and peasant revolution alike, and that contra the insistence of a strictly orthodox reading of capital, an industrial infrastructure born of a robust middle class was in fact not necessary, not necessary to a next historical stage. Gramsci maintained that result, that struggle is not the result of historical inevitability in an objective register, but again, a function of the collective will. The call for persistent class struggle as a will to action hardly makes of Gramsci a centrist by any standard other than those 
of the internecine debates internal to the party in the mid-1920s. It does, however, mark a subtle shift from the Gramsci of the late teens, who at times verged closely on, a line, on aligning with said maximalists on the grounds that the Bolsheviks were not discursively radical enough. Nonetheless, by the close of 1926, both Bordiga and Gramsci had fallen out of favor with Moscow. In broad historical leaps, it would take Moscow's defeat to shift Gramsci's fate in popular imaginary. This shift happened right after World War II. The pendulum of history swung dramatically in 1947. The party had to renegotiate its history in light of its dangerously transparent compromise with capitalism, delivering it the use of Italian labor power as a means to the exponential growth of American fixed capital as surplus value, which is to say compromise in scare quotes on capitalist terms. The PCI had to fulfill a double necessity. On the one hand, that of saving face against an all too, against all too obvious American influence, whose primary goal was to defend its interests from the threat of communism, real or imagined. The PCI had to harmonize this betrayal of labor while seeming to protect the interests of the people who constituted the new labor power harvested from a mass exodus of the peasantry from the rural South, delivered, as I said, to capital, now both American and Italian capital, in a context that Guy Debord has referred to as the crucible of globalization. Italy, in these decades, the crucible of globalization. Recent accounts, again, Emanuele Saccarelli's, have traced the numerous erasures and distortions required for this move on the part of the PCI. For a long time, the intellectual Gramsci, therefore, was a recurrent and important facet of a complex negotiation between the PCI's increasingly reformist outlook and its revolutionary origins. Each step taken by the PCI in what now looks like a long march away from its revolutionary beginnings was also accompanied by laborious reinterpretations of Gramsci's political thought, striving to demonstrate how this great thinker had already anticipated and prefigured each move, particularly in the suitably cryptic notebooks, end quote. So both tasks of, of saving face uh, and laundering had to be fulfilled while pretending to maintain independence under the sign of national identity. At the height of its unlikely popularity, the PCI situated Antonio Gramsci in a new light. It published for the first time in 1949 both the prison notebooks and the letters. Given the state of these texts, sketchy, often informal, very different from the polemical and polished texts of the teens and early to mid-20s, it was possible to frame the notebooks and letters in any number of ways to suit the present moment, that of rapid reconstruction and the dramatic passage to modernity that Gramsci could not have foreseen. The sudden importance of Gramsci for the party, again understood less as a revolutionary figure associated uh, with the Bolshevik movement of the teens and 20s, less as a Leninist, that is, and more as a national treasure, reflects all too transparently official culture's, culture's compensatory demands, all of which seem to obviate, at least for a time, any real resistance. Steve Wright, author of Storming Heaven, uh, the most comprehensive account of Italian operaismo and the rise of the Italian ultra-left in the 50s through 70s, uh, namely autonomia, notes that, quote, for Palmiro Tagliati, party leader from 1927 to his death in 1941, the decisive arena for gains in po post-fascist Italy was not the world of the workshop or field, but that of formal politics where accommodation with other social groups was a prerequisite, end quote. Togliatti himself had said, quote, today the problem facing Italian workers is not that of doing what was done in Russia, end quote, and instead called for intensified economic growth within a framework of private ownership. He believed that high productivity and high wages would be the spur to economic expansion 
against untrammeled free market forces. Quote, whatever Togliatti's attacks upon liberals like Luigi Einaudi, his own views on development shared more assumptions with such opponents than he himself realized. The most important of these was the emphasis placed on substantial increase in productivity as the only path to Italy's salvation, end quote. He also refused to discuss the working class as an autonomous force, referencing instead an unspecified people. Gramsci consequently came to be associated with culture as a phenomenon transcending politics altogether, much less revolutionary politics, much less insurrectionary politics of refusal, of wildcat strikes and tactical sabotage, characteristic of the ultra-left of the 60s and 70s. He was understood to have coined the term hegemony to denote official culture's modality of self-consolidation. It matters not that Gramsci himself attributed the term to Lenin, who used it to denote a rising proletariat. The term then made its way into the fairly anodyne interpretive systems of post-Marxist and cultural Marxists. En route, deference to a history of Italian letters imagined him uh, a, quote, humanist. Here is Saccarelli once more. Gramsci, quote, Gramsci's reception was the vehicle through which the PCI could, it imagined, part gracefully with its heritage and ease its collective conscience through such a difficult transition. The PCI was burying Gramsci politically once and for all, but in return, it would do its best to intercede for his soul to ascend to the better place where classical authors reside, end quote. By contrast, the Italian post-war avant-garde or neo-avant-garde moved in the opposite direction. Between imported American culture on the one hand and the defeated left's opportunistic use of its own history, and finally, the ignominy of Italian futurism associated by then with the fascist regime, Italian painters had another difficult path to carve. The recovery of international modernism proved at once a point of departure and a historical politi political matrix from within which to dismantle and reconfigure art. The Italian ultra-left of the 60s and 70s was thus constituted through a refusal, a negative relation to the PCI's compromise of class struggle in favor, ironically enough, of a barely accomplished party hegemony. This new left positioned itself explicitly against the party and the party form in general as that form had been theorized by Lenin, now accurately cast as an agent of betrayal. By the 1960s, Mario Tronti could say, quote, it is not a matter today of using the PCI in a revolutionary direction. It is far too late for this. The goal is again completely negative, end quote. Tronti's negative orientation toward the PCI on the side of, the, of Italian workers on the one hand in, an, in anticipation of a truly international communist praxis on the other, has been described as a kind of Copernican revolution for its parallactic forward and backward strategy. In an inverse logic that nonetheless got at the heart of the dialectic, Tronti saw that the PCI had come to support capital's effort to emancipate itself from workers in the miracle brought about by US dollars in the name of Italian reconstruction. So if capital was uh, discovered to be autonomous, workers were to declare their own autonomy, hence, hence the term autonomia. This position, moving back to move forward, moves in, in uncanny parallel to the way in which Italian artists look to the Soviet models of abstraction for a way out of the morass of Italian painting in confrontation with American individualist expressionism. The Copernican Revolution rhymes with the regressive mobilization of pre-war modernism to drive past cultural colonization in the interest of an autochthonist yet international art practice. While I am not suggesting a conscious, much less causal relationship among cultural forms of recovery of the utopian aspirations of the interwar period, I am noting the dialectical relationship among those forms in the expanded field of what we, we might call the political unconscious mediated by culture in Italy from the late 40s through the 60s. 
The complicated recovery of Gramsci's work functions as a prism to understand the primary axis of contradiction, structuring Italian politics and culture from 49 through 69, from the moment when American capital was nursing a soon to burgeon industry in the North, up to the summer of 1969, when violent wildcat strikes at Fiat in, in Turin and elsewhere finally shattered such official communist politics and opened onto a new chapter of autonomous communist politics. Based on his uh, 1925 critique of Bordiga, it stands to reason to suppose Gramsci would have been pleased. But again, as I have argued elsewhere, these seismic movements were already succinctly prefigured in the violent internal dissolution of painting, a 500-year-old practice originating in the same, quote, Italian humanist tradition in which the PCI was eager to categorize Gramsci as cultural prophylactic, as cultural treasure against political action in the context of class war. In this foment of contradiction and reconstruction, ultra-leftist Raniero Panzieri emerges as a lone figure to directly return to the textual legacy of Antonio Gramsci, asking after the fundamental relation between labor and capital independently, unmediated by given models of party or union. Working this position out, Panzieri frequently returned to the Ordine Nuovo period of the early 1920s, in which Gramsci insisted that the proletariat itself had to replace both the state and traditional organization of the labor movement. Panzieri stated, quote, only in this way, through the refusal of party specificity, partitarietà, and its self-affirmation beyond political alignments, can Marxist culture rediscover its true function, end quote. The element of Leninism with which Panzieri most outspokenly disagreed was planning, while Lenin saw central planning as the antidote to the fundamental chaos of capitalism Panzieri saw it as the logic behind the state consolidation of the market and the reciprocal capitalist consolidation of the state. The key term is the state. His exposure to anarchist and anti-status politics may have informed his position. He was influenced by socialism or, bar or socialisme ou barbarie in France and the anarchist anti-statism of its founder, Cornelius Castoride, Ca I can never pronounce this, Castoriadis. Castoriadis. <laughs> Castoriadis. <laughs> Thank you. He had been officially kicked out of the Socialist Party in 1959, whereupon he moved to Turin, where he met Aquati and Tronti and founded with them Quaderni Rossi. In any case, he seems to have recovered aspects of Gramsci's spirit against the doctrine, against that of Lenin and party doctrine alike. Um, I was going to conclude with a brief meta-level excursus on the nature of the floating signifier, but I'll note only that Etienne Balibar, writing in 2011, uh, notes that the word communism has uh, connected the, the many adventures of the 20th century, also operating as a, as a floating signifier. But um, I'll, I'll conclude with the, my, my final thought here. And so the proper name Gramsci comes to function like a sign for thinking the entwined relationship between ideological oppression and material exploitation, a floating signifier that offers a way into the complex and contradictory real movement of history th that delivers us to crisis capitalism in our present moment. As such, it stands to reason that he figures prominently in recent studies that trace the particular composition of labor pools retroactively naturalized and justified by various racisms, sexisms, and any number of identity politics that contributed to the formation of a hegemony that forgets how it was made. In the book, Colonization and Community, the Vancouver Island Coal Field and the Making of the British Columbian Working Class, a book, sort of my personal Bible and trying to understand the Pacific Northwest, um, uh, John Douglas Belshaw relies heavily on Gramsci in noting the ways in which waves of immigration from Scotland and Ireland came to dominate and squeeze out Aboriginal, Indigenous, and Asian labor in British Columbia in the 1870s and 1880s 
in a historical struggle that resulted in the understanding of labor, of, of dignified labor, of, of the proletariat on whose behalf uh, unions once fought, as a reified category of whiteness in the North American context. Already part of the settler colonial state's insatiable demand for surplus value extracted. So there are always debates about whether surplus value uh, emanates strictly from labor power or whether it can be drawn in unmediated fashion from natural resources and from the land. I'm going with the latter for the moment. Um, extracted from natural resources, mining, forestry, fishing, trapping, etc., the ossification of labor power as a property of whiteness itself doubled back to justify the theft of resources and the second classing of non-white labor pools. Claxton's Ode to Gramsci banners, with which some of you may have, some to which some of you may have been introduced this morning, uh, find special resonance in, in this history of the labor power of the Pacific Northwest. So many thanks for your attention.